Well, as you can see, yet another little bench digital multimeter, old three and a half digital multimeter. This is another eBay special, another forty dollar bonus prize, basically. Just a little. It's a thirty four thirty eight digital multimeter by Hewlett Packard. It's um, manual slash auto ranging, which is kind of amusing. You can see it's got manual range buttons, and then it's got an auto via ohms button. So this is. I'm not actually sure about the dating on this. You can see it's it's got HPIV, which could be potentially useful. We've got you know volts, AC, DC, DC, AC, milliamp, milliamp AC, you know, milliamp DC, milliamp AC, and then kilo ohm. So, anyways, calibration void if your stickers have been broken. And this is kind of a little amusing tidbit. So, obviously, we've got a, a loose banana jack here. And the uh, the person selling it called this a loose knob on the back of the multimeter, which amused me because it's you know I don't know how they thought of that as a knob, but it's such a banana jack. But uh, I had a good chuckle at that. You can see here's the rear. Um, you know here are the rear BNCs, and you can see on the it has a little toggle here so that if this is integrated into some sort of stationary system you toggle it over to rear inputs which it actually is set to right now. Let's see that is our right screwdriver and then when it's on rear input you can basically use it as a you know a remotely readable digital multimeter. Whereas with the front inputs it's more like a bench multimeter. So that's for situations where it's integrated into a system and read out over HPIV, which is you know, I'm actually, I'm not sure when this was produced, but it was probably at the point where, you know, automating the whole system using HPIV was kind of a big, fancy thing. So, whole case is kind of slightly sticky from removed stickers. So obviously the first thing I need to do is figure out how to tighten that down. Because it's contacting the case. You can see the metal shaft. Oh wow, it looks like the threads broke off. I'm gonna have to replace that entirely. That's slightly bothersome. It's not well, it's not like I really intend to use the rear the rear uh, banana jacks at all anyway. So Oh hello. So they said something was rattling around and it looks like what we have here. So this is a TO what is it? Uh, oh, bother. I'm blanking on this. The metal can transistor case. But this is a little heat sink. It's intended to snap onto one of these metal can transistors. So that's probably what was rattling. I assume what was rattling was just a banana jack. But if this was floating around in the case, it would have also rattled. Oh, yeah. Slip on there, you. Hopefully I haven't messed the leads up too much. You can see we've got a number of interesting little devices in here. Resistive elements, big ceramic ASIC. That's probably like an HPIV controller. Various things, there's a big TO3 uh, device here. Some interesting stuff going on. You can see they've got the construction of this is just wonderful. They had to feed these cables through here, so they put little grommets in these insets. So it looks like the one up here fell off. Here you can see the big front rear panel switch. It seems like this is kind of a double sided instrument. <laughs> That's amazing. So only one of these screws has an anti shake washer on it, and that happened to be the loose screw. Actually, two of them. Also, you can see that it appears we have a slightly mismatched screw set. Obviously, we have like a two layer PCB sandwich. I'm not sure how this opens up. Most of these Hewlett Packard systems are designed to be ridiculously easily serviceable. So, in most situations, the whole thing kind of does like a 
like the internal boards will tilt out of the way and jazz like that. So I'm not sure. You can also see some good stuff down here, like look at these huge metal brackets between the PC board and the HPIB interface connection just to make this a really strong, rigid connection. Oh look, so you can also see down here we have so this dip here looks like it sets the HPIB bus address. Here's kind of a close-up of the PCB, you can see. So he wrote something on there, it's, that's probably the DMM, or the control ASIC. That's That is a MOSTEC MK34127, but that's the CPU, or whatever, it's a, it, a CPU or like a dedicated controller ASIC. So, so this has these two plastic pins. There's another one up here that make me think that this whole thing tilts out, but I don't really see how that would work. So also, I would guess that this whole upper board here is like a an HPIB add-on. So, I'm not certain about that. Oh, yeah, so... Looks like there are... four screws that hold this in. Turned it on yet? I've just taken it apart. Oops. So now this whole thing. Is more or less free. Oops. Oh, that's nice. They've got like manually inserted blocking plugs so that you can't re miswire it when you reassemble it, I guess. Or just polarize. Oh, I wonder where that was supposed to connect. So I think this slides forward to unlatch would be my my seat of the pants guess. Start looking in the other side. Oh, hey, look, that's nice. These, are, these screws just go straight into a. Um, this shield is designed to be removable. Actually, let me move camera positions real quick. There's a slightly more wide view. So, this seems to be held in by one screw in the center, which is going into that insert, which is very annoying. So it looks like this definitely does have to come out somehow. See how it slides on this side, it just doesn't slide on this side, which makes me think I missed a screw. Oh, I bet I did. Yep, I missed a screw. Because I is stupid. Alright. So this indeed appears to be like a Generic HPIB. I think this is presumably an add on module. So you can also see that if we look on the front panel, there is a connector right down in there. 
from the guess and look of it, that's probably for the Listen Talk remote status LEDs. So I would guess that if I take all of this out, I bet it would still work. So I will need to. That's it. Switch from rear to front. <laughs> so there's that nice little cookie switch. So we can see back here, here's this broken banana jack. And it looks like the threads have snapped, which is rather annoying. So you can see that here's the threaded section and it's kind of snapped off. So it's not quite as easily repairable. So here's your front end. Oh yeah, let me get this blasted grommet out of this side panel. And that's not really stuck. something. This rubber has basically turned her a solid material. Wow, that just shot everywhere. Eh, well. Okay. So, there is the connector I was talking about, which I'm betting is just for these three LEDs up here. So here's the display interface ribbon cable, or, well, it's a parallel cable. You can see here, this is kind of interesting. So here are the inputs, and then they run it through a coax just over to this switch here. So I bet what's going on here is they were having issues with the, uh, the front panel display multiplexing, because I would imagine it's multiplex coupling into this connection. So they had to shield it while it passed over the... You can also see there's a few other little oddments in here. Oh wait, no, there's some more cables running there. So presumably, this is your main, like, DMM ASIC. Got Cal stuff. These are probably op amps or something along those lines. And then here is the actual multimeter front end, and we'll get in there in a minute. So you can see we have line voltage connected to all primary components independent of the power set's position. The shield is attached to the COM terminal, attached COM to ground during servicing. So basically they're saying the case is connected to the ground. And then this is interesting, so we have line connections for various line voltages. So what you do is you set presumably zero ohm resistor jumpers, and if we look back here, there they are. So that's the, uh, it's kind of a cranky solder joint. So this is your line select resistors right there. And you can see that right now we're set to 104 to 127. You can see it's the outer three, the outer ones. So that's kind of amazing. You can also see that they've got just a whole bundle of windings on the transformer. They've got separate windings for the HPIB interface. So presumably, I'm not sure if they, they only used one transformer and then this was just not connected sometimes or what. But that's kind of interesting. So here's the input and you can see we've got nice bonding to the chassis ground. So this seems to be doing the same thing that the, uh, like the Keithley I did a teardown a short while ago was doing in that they're switching the power on the secondary side of the mains input transformer. So the power switch is, it's a nice clicky hard power switch, but all it does is it switches the secondary. The primary is always connected, so the transformer is always energized. I'm not too sure why they're doing that. It's kind of an, it's an interesting approach, but it seems like the downside is that you know, you have more power draw because the trans you always have the magnetizing current of the transformer. And I don't know what the advantage is, aside from the fact that the transformer stays warm. But I don't think Temco, that's not really relevant. Excuse me, relevant. So here's the underside. You can see here we have... That's quite interesting. So... So this is the input section. And actually, if you look here, you can see we have plastic inserts scattered all around here. So what these plastic inserts are telling me is that all of these are ultra-high impedance nodes. Because they had to, they used this insert to prevent leakage to the circuit board. So basically, there's a, a very large amount of extremely high impedance circuitry in here. 
because, you know, again, you know, actually, that's interesting. It looks like they've got a guard ring around that one despite this fact. So I wonder if this is like, this is presumably the highest impedance input section. But what this basically is, is that circuit boards, particularly when, you know, the surface of the board gets a little dirty, are have a, a very a resistance. It's a very, very high resistance. But nevertheless, there is a conductance across the surface of the board. So you see techniques like guard rings, which I mentioned in the Keithley teardown, you know, where basically the idea is if you want to prevent any current from leaking across the resistance of the board, you wrap the traces you that you need to have a high impedance in in a, a basically a another trace ring, and then you actively drive that trace ring so that they're exactly the same voltage as the node, and the end result is that because there's no voltage gradient effectively, there's no current flow. So that's a fairly common technique. But when you need even higher impedances that aren't achievable like that, what the common thing to do is you use little plastic or Teflon inserts in the board, and that basically gives you a much better insulator to hold this up. And then what we'll see on the other side is fly wires, ergo, you know, basically they will have brought the wire into, you know, they'll, they'll solder the wire to this tab, and then they'll solder a resistor to it and run that over to a, like the leg of a part that's been also lifted, stuff like that. There's some interesting application notes I've read. You know, when you're dealing with some of the uh, the modern op amps with like the pico amp input impedance, or excuse me, the pico amp input leakage current, where they discuss you know ultra ultra high impedance you know giga ohm layout techniques and how you, you, a lot of it actually has to be done ha by hand just because there's no machines that'll do it. But that stuff's quite interesting to read. Interesting to read, and if you want to take a look at the stuff, bother me in the comments, and I'll post links to it. So I think what I'll do now because this is looking quite interesting. So you can also see they've got 200 volt range, 20 ohm, 0, 1.9 volt, 20 kilohertz, 19 volt, 20 kilohertz. Yeah. So you can see how... Actually, that's a, a pretty good example of exactly the kind of construction I was talking about. So you can see how for some of these pins, where's my screwdriver? Like you can see how they've bent this pin up and soldered it to this little, this little thing, which is then soldered to presumably a ground. So what's happening here is this is like an integrating capacitor, and because leakage from these nearby connections would basically pollute the measurement. Sorry, I just got an email would pollute the measurement. They've actually lifted it up and they're floating it on this little isolated pad. You know, and then here's a big, I think that's probably a resistor. I'm pretty confident it's a resistor. It might be an inductor. You know, and they've got another one. And then you can see over here, we have the same construction. But they actually, this is all done by hand. They have to bend that leg up and stick it in that little, you know, the little pot and then fill it with solder. See here, there's a little variable capacitor. Seems fairly nice. It's got these really nice little test points everywhere. So on and so forth. You know, so presumably these are really, really, really specialty ASICs, and if you launch one of those, you know, there's not much you can do. This is quite nice. Here we have a little terminal that's labeled COM, and that means that's ground. Somebody commenting on the Rigon video. Hey, Meta. So you can see some other interesting stuff, like look. What the deuce is that? I don't really know what that is. Is that like a glass encapsulated resistor? Actually, let me change lenses because I don't know what the hell that is. So maybe somebody can shed some more light on this, but... I mean, it looks like, first of all, we have some PCB traces, and then this... That's glass. So whatever that is, it's glass encapsulated. So we have what looks to be an inductor. I guess that's a series inductor. And then whatever the deuce that is. It could be a capacitor. It could be some sort of... Bizarro precision encapsulated resistor, like an ultra, ultra, ultra low tempco resistor. Here you can see this construction I was talking about, how they've bent the pins up. You can see they've gotten, they've done it in a lot of places. They've got like three separate sections. You can see there's diodes there, and then so presumably this trace here, which goes over and soldered onto the top of one of these switches, is presumably one of the inputs. And I'm saying presumably repeatedly again, but you can see here's this big resistor or something like that. That's actually interesting. Look at that. They've got little glass. I wonder if that's to prevent solder from creeping up the, the 
trace, or excuse me, the wire. That's kind of interesting. More diodes. The construction on this is really beautiful. There's a J10. That's going to be a capacitor. Through the way for integration, you've got more. These are all like eight pin packages. You can't really make out that here's a little standoff. So you can see these are really specialty A6 and they've got like it looks like a hand epoxy cap on because you can see that their epoxy looks to have been hand applied. Look at that. What is that? Is that a resistor or an RF choke? More interesting or rather unusual component packages. 7914 DP. Is that a negative 14 volt regulator? <laughs> 1820223-1. It's made by AMD, which is kind of interesting. Continuing on, you can see we've got some little. Looks like those are probably wet slug tantrums. Look at those. Those are going to be really expensive capacitors. Another 7914, another 7. Whatever these are, I really, I kind of doubt they're. they're these aren't going to be voltage regulators. A 7914 is probably 1979, week 14. Um, these are 1820. These are going to probably be op amps because they've got eight legs. You can see this is a, uh, that's going to, I'm not too sure what that is actually. Let me see if I can't make out the writing on it. 1826. I can't really read it. There's a rather oxidized to hell tuning capacitor. Yeah, but this is, you know, another op amp of some sort because it's got a stand of light. Over here we have something interesting. This is an RCA, this is a transistor, or some, or it could be a FET or even a, a um, JFET. Excuse me, because it's only got three legs. But the fact that it's RCA branded is interesting. You can see we've got like carbon comp. That looks like a diode, though there's several different types of diodes. I guess these are carbon comp inductor. There's a bigger diode, though this one is in glass encapsulated. Weird, more weird jazz. These may be current measuring shunts, actually, now that I think about it. No, I don't think this thing can do very much current. 2 amp max, yeah, so most of these meters seem to be 2 amp max. There's a big disc capacitor that appears to be between two shorted pads. I wonder what the devil that's used for. What the heck? What use could that be? This seems to be, it seems to be on one solid copper pour. That's bizarre. So these are presumably like input protection. I'm saying presumably a lot. Actually, these may be, these may be resistors, though they look like inductors. They've got the, kind of the teal color of inductors. There's a little 2 and 1, 3, 2, 9. That is a 3-pin package. It's a really short 3-pin package. A lot of interesting semiconductors here. Would not want to repair this. I cannot make out what that says, though. That is another three-pin lead, so it's going to be transistor. Also of interest is that a lot of these are kind of mounted a little wibbledy wobbledy. There's a 2N2904. Wow! That's a common. These are two little off amps of some sort. So there we have something that says 10 kilohertz. So presumably this uses like an, uh, a, st a standard integrating op amp, uh, an integrating A to D, maybe dual slope, maybe earlier, but I would bet that it, the integration period is 10 kilo, or the, the cycle time is 10 kilohertz. So I may try powering the sucker up and scoping that and seeing what I get. This is interesting, so here's the interface to the HPIB board, so there may be some sort of simple digital signaling on there, I'll take a look at that in a minute too. We've got some little... 3016. Look at that emitter base collector, that's nice. Little transistors. So you can see this was Rev B. This is a ground lead which goes just ground into various bits of metal. 88809F Rev B 034 38. So this is the 3438 is the model number 66511. And there's a serial number printed on the board. So down here we just have 1820. So this 1820 is a recurring thing. So I think these are probably uh, marked specifically for 
Hewlett Packard because this is a national semi part. But so this must be a, a 1820, like that's the, the series number, and then this is 2254, is the model of these chips. So the proximity of these chips makes me fairly confident that these are responsible for display driving because that's what this connection here is. Because you can see that, you know, these are 1820-0, 223-1, so this is presumably a, a specific, a very part specific model number. So whatever these are, uh, I don't think there's going to be much luck looking these up because they're made specifically for that. Oh, another comment. These here, these look like silver mica capacitors. And those are very expensive, very low leakage, very high quality capacitors. So these are, you know, like fancy pants. So I bet they're using these for the integrator. Let's see, there's another little test point. Anyways, so that's the majority of, you know, this whole section. They're not using guard rings because they've got these, they've got the little plastic inserts instead. That's kind of their, they're easier than doing, a, using a guard ring alternative. Board's quite nice. Let me switch back to my other lens. No, the board's quite nice. I'm not sure this, I mean, I'm not sure about the error on this. If it's 79 is accurate, it should be tape, and certainly some of these the traces, which don't seem to follow anything, look, make me think it's probably tape, but at the same time, they've... I guess there was a push to follow rectilinear coordinates, even with tape, which kind of surprises me. Or this could have been really early CAD. Excuse me? But never mind. So, this could have been really early CAD, but... It's too... some of this stuff, like, look down here. I mean, like, they've got a whole lot of different... slightly different variants. That's actually kind of messy. Like, right there is kind of... That's a really tight corner. Also looks like this has been reworked right in this area, but that's about it. You can also see from the look of it, what just fell out. Oh, little bits of plastic. So this is only a two layer board, which is pretty impressive. So I wonder if, I mean, you can see that we've got separate windings for the HPIB interface, and I wonder if this transformer on these is all the same, or if basically they get when you bought, or if you bought the HPIB upgrade, they sent you a new transformer. It'd be interesting to look into. Another kind of cool thing here is you can see this, is what they've got is a fuse mounted or a, in the banana jack, so you can actually see, you know, basically the amp range Slotted screwdriver is too small. Where is that bigger one? No, there it is. It's all rusty, but it'll work. So you can see that you give that a twist, and then the fuse is installed in the banana jack. So, actually, just out of curiosity, let's power this sucker up and see if it works at all. It was sold as works, don't really know enough to test. Alright, so it comes up. Well, it seems like the screen is kind of filthy. I can live with that. So. Let's see, it's on auto ranging. So let me grab just some test leads. I will. I'm just going to stick these into my power supply. So this should be 9 volts. Possible I've got it on the wrong input setting. Yeah, that's interesting. So that, actually with the slot pointing to rear, it's in the front. And with the slot pointing to front, it's in the rear. Okay, so there we have 9.09, .09, which looks to be about right. Let's go to point. 
1.4 seems to be working so I'm actually not sure if this is even three and a half digits this may just be a straight up three digit multimeter but anyways oh Christ what is going on why are you notifying me twice for the same text message fucking phone um, which should be 0.6 so when does it scale down? Because this is supposed to not drop down to millivolts. So what happens if I go like that? I see. So I have to be below 200 millivolts for it to kick down. So it has a 20 millivolt range, which is not bad. Oh, hey, look, it worked. So now it's at around 60 millivolts. Cool. It also has a microamp range, which is pretty impressive. But we can see the auto scale seems to be pretty peppy. Oh, it is, it is three and a half digits, because look, right now we're getting 14.95. So it does use that half digit. So there's kind of some... The display looks a little weird. One nice thing is that this one actually has an OL... Though it looks like the... The, um, the overrange, the ranging is slow. Like you can see, ohm, and then it kicks up to kilo ohms, and then it kicks up to mega ohms. <laughs> I can live with that. So, for the sake of my curiosity, fire up the scope. Awa! So let me go, I will put the ground on the comm, and we'll go on the 10 kilohertz thingy. So I think this should be the 10 kilohertz integrating waveform. Yes, yes. Um, that's certainly something. So, well, that's kind of interesting. It's 10.04 kilohertz, though. So, and I have no idea. It's a pot with a horizontal adjustment trimmer. I have no freaking clue how I'm supposed to trim that. So anyways, it's 10.04, that's pretty damn close. Let's have a look at some of these other... So this, I think, is just one of the supply rails. Let's see, am I... I'm DC coupled. Well, that could be a ground. Okay, so that is... Oh, that is really negative. That's negative 18, so that's is presumably positive 18. Positive 12, ground, is positive 18. So there's a positive 12 and positive a negative 18. So let me see, what do we have here? Random voltage. That's interesting. I'm seeing clock and data. It's like a tip select. It looks like we have ground, five volts, and then two. Okay, let me grab two additional scope probes. I have to say, I'm fairly pleased that the Rigol scope comes with four probes. It's rather nice of them. So, 
also. Hey, this is why I bought a four channel scope. So. is whatever is going on on the so I definitely saw something on the purple trace which is the I thought was chip select is it just I don't know what to use that is. Anyways, this may just use a, a, a long quiescent period as the basically the chip select. So if we ignore, so ignore all of the crap on the blue trace because that's just because I'm only using the ground clip on one scope lead. So you can see. It's a pretty distinct, actually let me, um, yeah, I'm not seeing anything on the, uh, the purple trace. So, anyways. So, I'll just turn that off. What we should be able to see is, as I turn the voltage down, yeah, that's counting down. Yeah, check that out. So if you need a high precision ADC, you can just sniff this line right here. Actually, let's see. Uh, where are my decodes? See to code. I want to be SPI and then my SS. Let's see. That's not what I want. Menu. I want S clock is going to be channel one and it looks like it's rising edge. Right, and then I'll just make the threshold um, that the network. My S clock, my MISO is going to be channel 2. And my threshold, it looks like the threshold's basically shared. Bus bed is on, stay select, polarity high. So it looks like you can't do a non That's annoying. So it appears there's no um no you can't do an SPI decode without using the without using a, a chip select which is very obnoxious. So, I'd need to synthesize the chip select. That's annoying. So, um, So that's a pain in the flaming posterior. Um, yeah, well that's annoying. So I can't just kind of trick it into thinking it's fixed on either. Let's see, D. 
data bits. How many bits do I have here, anyways? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's 24 bits. So presumably some of these are So it looks like what we have here is you know probably the first four to six bits are status. Well, that's kind of interesting. It seems like it only updates every time it gets a good reading. And it's not outputting anything on any other mode. Um, anyways, that's kind of cool. So you can just kind of see a, a little So there's with 30 volts. Actually, so there's with them in series. So that's 60 volts. Cool. So you can see there's just kind of a cute little look at, it. and you can see that there's bobbling around a little bit, but I'm not sure what's going on there. Actually, that might be an interesting thing to look at. So what I just did is I, I put channel... Let me turn this decode off. So, it looks like whatever mechanism they're using to generate the clock is presumably... I'm saying presumably a lot recently. RC based or something along those lines because you can see that here's that 10 kilohertz, rather nasty looking 10 kilohertz clock. Um, how do I turn this? So, you can see that our, we're synchronous with that pretty much right on the button. So that's kind of cool looking. And you can also see that our, uh, the period that we have is... Really? Uh... So it appears it's doing approximately 90, 90 readings a second. Supposedly, I trigger free to 90 ratings. Well, actually, hang on, I gotta turn on. I think I need to turn on some hold off setting. Uh, hold off. So, actually, uh, cursor manual. So, what is my total packet length? So, if I go from there. So, my total duration is about 60 microseconds. So I think what's going on is I'm triggering within the packet. Uh, so that means I have to turn on at least 60 microseconds of hold off. Okay, so maybe I am getting 90 packets per second. So it may be resending the packet repeatedly. But we can actually see that the period Yeah, so if we go to the cursor, you can see that the, the clock rate is half of the system 10 kHz clock. So basically every system clock, it performs whatever operation is required. So, you know, system clock, shift out the new data, shift in clock, you know, so on and so forth. So it's running at half the clock rate, which makes sense because you to do SPI properly, you can't really run at a frequency more than half of your clock rate. So that's cool to look at. And it seems to be reading more or less accurately. Like right now it's setting, saying 30 millivolts. But right now it should be 5 volts. And it's reading 100 millivolts high, though I'm going to say that I don't really trust the readouts on my bench supply more than anything else. I can do a comparison with a multimeter, but whatever. So that's just a neat little thing to look at. You can So basically here you have you can just basically sniff. If you're so inclined, you could probably get, you know, a meaningful readout from this cheapo little digital multimeter. Well, it probably wasn't cheap when it was made, considering all the fancy pants caps in here. But, you know, you can see here I am, I'm just 
I'm just clipped onto the the connector over here, and then this is probing the uh, the system clock. So there's my one ground lead. should probably say that. So, let me turn this off. And what I think I will do is I will put the HPIB module in. So you can see it looks like they've actually gone off and uh, just stuck little bits of plastic in these connectors so that the pinning is works out properly. That's kind of amusing. There's that connector down there. So this should go on that. Yep. Oh, yeah. So these. So this is the tap off for that readout. Those are the power supply connections. This whole thing just kind of sits on. So this is quite nicely designed. You can see it's got these plastic pegs. And then those just sit into these notches. So the whole thing is very, it's a very nice design. But then just about everything from the 70s, 80s design from brand names like Hewlett Packard is beautifully designed. So that just sits down in there. And we have, so presumably that's just front panel, and I'm saying presumably a lot again. Hey, hey, meta. So then there's power. So presumably I, presumably I say presumably a lot, because presumably the presum, presumably presumably is a thing that I presumably like. Presumably. Also, I guess it is worth stating that I am presuming a lot. Presumably. So, I guess I use presumably as a fancier stand-in for I'm guessing. Though, I would say that I think I am, if nothing else, making a partially educated guess. So you can see this whole thing kind of wibbles it's basically only held in by the back. But, you know, I haven't done anything about that broken banana jack, but, you know what. So, still works. And hey, look, we have status LEDs on the HPIB interface, so if I unplug that, yeah. So this whole cable here is just for the readout. So we can see that we're currently on talk. That's interesting. This is a little loose. Oh, I think that's it. No. Oh, more plastic bits rattling around. Oh, whoops, I can't put this in yet. I've got because the bottom plate has to bolt in through the board. This whole thing is kind of sticky. I'm gonna have to just scrub the bananas out of it with some goo gone. So, you come up, you go like so. So, what's going on is Oh yeah, incidentally, I said I was looking into buying a lapel mic. Well I bought a couple I bought a cheapo lapel mic and it is a turd. Uh so at the moment you're stuck with the noise. Alright, so this there's one screw that goes in from the other side. For some reason, I don't really understand. 
Oh, from the look of it, it's for grounding. So I think this screw is kind of the ground coupling because there's a this whole PCB is gold plated from the look of it. And this one screw has a gold kind of rim around it. So these are presumably just <laughs> these I would guess are just for supporting this panel rather than or actually I think the way this works, I think I'm, I've got this backwards. This actually holds up the middle of the board. Because otherwise the board is always supported around the edges and it definitely wobbles a little bit. Anyways. These four screws are in and snug. So now this whole thing. So you can see, actually, yeah, it's remember. I loosened the nuts and bolts on this TO3, thinking I might need to be doing so. And I should re them. You can also see that this is... kind of has some flex to it, just because of the way it's folded. Not the most impressive construction, but, you know, whatever. Once all the screws are in, it's pretty rigid. Slides back and sits down a little bit. And then we have one, two, three, four, five, five screws that retain the whole sucker. I see. Oh, look at that. So, this board appears to slide out. Okay, I see how this works, yeah. So, kind of in the continuing tradition of clever screwless construction, okay. these were blasted grommets. So you have these little notches here, and this slides over to those notches. I'm assuming the grommets aren't in the way. Slides over to these notches and then lifts up, and then the board comes out. And it also looks like I need to put one of the screws in there. So here is this board. So this is another two layer board made in the US of A. The A of the US, and here you can see these big clamps that they used to hold the HPIB interface to the board to presumably reduce stress. <laughs> Man, I think presumably a lot. Ugh. So here's this board. You can start to, in just a quick close up, you can see 182169. So this is more <laughs> Christ. Oh wow, I'm amusing. So more ASICs, I would guess. So these are quite interesting. You can see over here we have, oh, I know what those are. Those are opto isolators. Those are old opto isolators. So this, I think is, yeah. So these are the, these are the isolation channels. So the way this works is this whole board is completely floating. So what we have here are just the three inputs from the, you know, this interface connector. So this has, you can see it's got five pins. So I would guess we have, you know, I'm pretty confident this is ground, if I remember correctly. Ground, five volts, and then three digital, you know, three signal channels. And you can see that these all go here. Actually, it looks like this is, so if we look there, it looks like there's a pull up and this goes to there. So I would bet that this, Maybe the reason I wasn't seeing the chip select is because it's open collector. 
you can also see that this goes to a transistor and then we have another little transistor over here. So these are old, old opto isolators. So the way these work is literally it's a like a three millimeter LED and a phototransistor shoved in a little tube and then just glued in. Oh, actually it looks like we have this one's going in this, this one's going that way and these two are going the other way. So I bet this is a pull up and this is, yeah, so this is a pull up, I would bet. See if I can't make out where this trace goes. Um, uh, actually, I don't know where that's running. Oh, I see. Yeah, so actually, I was tracing this out on the bottom side of the board, and so these two leads here are connected together across this trace here on the other side of the board. So you can see we have ground, which runs all around the place. We have power, and then there's, you know, one signal here, and then this other signal goes to here. So this is, you know, so these two are going this way, and this one's going this way. So this is just a little opto interface. Down here we have lots of 7400 series logic. Uh, I'm not going to look these up. You can look them up if you want. Um, you know, shift registers, jazz like that. There's a capacitor. X5D103, so that's point one mic. That's kind of interesting, a little axial lead package. You know, these are all... 1820. So these are have these are generic logic, but they've got a a HP part number on them as well. Little tamp. You know, here's this big fancy pants controller, probably a GPIB controller of some sort. Uh, we have more 7438, 74 LS14, low speed shot key. This is fairly. Some of the stuff is recent. I don't know what these are. These are two part specific Motorola branded 7950. Um, National Semi is ASIC of some sort, 74LS273, that's a big, that's, 10, this is a 20 pin dip, that's kind of an unusual package, ASIC. Here are your selectors for the dip, uh, AB, I don't know what the deuce this is, I think this is a, um, a PLD, I would guess, though I'm just talking out of my posterior 74 series. This is interesting, this is a Mostec MK. 34127N with a HP part number on it. Also, 7915, that may be the production date or it may be a model number. I'm guessing it's the, I'm guessing it's the production date, so this is 1979. Also, this is kind of interesting. Look at the leads coming out of the lead frame on this dip. They seem to have a, a groove cut in the middle. I wonder if that's to allow them to flex more easily. You know, I wonder if they're worried about the leads trans, uh, passing stresses into the internal, so they cut a groove in them so that they would flex there. More El Salvador, 7400 series logic, 74 LS05. This is interesting. This is a Sir dip. Uh, whereas most of these are just epoxy packaged. Let me get over here. We can see here some of the tabs that hold it in the enclosure. Some little electrolytics or wet slug tents, transistors, little pot, hilly trim. And then we just got some big, chunky electrolytics. 7939, yeah, so I think 79 is the production date. And then you've got diodes and jazz. So here's your power input, and it looks like uh, rectification is here. Um, here's this thing, which the I don't see the part number on it. I could take the heatsink off, but it was a pain enough to get it on. That is only a three pin device, so it's a transistor. Huh. You can see we have lots of test points. This is kind of cool over here. They've got a test point for every HPIB pin. So they're trying to, basically that's to make HPIB debugging much easier. You can also see that if you look there, it looks like a whole boatload of the pins are all strapped together. Because I don't think this has, it doesn't do a lot of bidirectional comms. So it's interesting that they put the test points in here because normally for debugging uh, HPIB, you just use something like this. Yeah, don't ask where this came from. I've had it for a while. So this is a uh, a Tektronics GPIB to uh, Logic Pod adapter. So basically, you, you would just you know if you have an HPIB system that you're or a GPIB system, which HPIB and GPIB are the same thing for the most part. Uh, most of the connectors are they have a male on one end and a female on the other. So you just kind of stack your cables going off the rest of your equipment and then plug this on top of it. And then this would feed into a scope or a logic analyzer or something like that. 
So these are just fancy pants connectors that go into these little logic pods I have that I've honestly never had any use for, but keep them around because you never know. Just it's, it's a funny bit of history and you can see actually it seems that they basically some of this is reconfigurable. So they've got these little jumper leads and then you can choose which of these pins you want to strap in various ways. So you can kind of strap these various pins to different positions to do some configuration or sniff different channels or whatever. Which is kind of a little cool doohickey. It's a neat little bit of kit. Uh, I wish I had a use for it, but yeah, they've even got pull here embossed on it. It's all gold plated and nice and high quality and so forth. You can see this board has the same. You've got lots of lice. They put these little loop clips on here, ground. Which is really nice if you if you're ever debugging stuff or if you're ever designing a board and you want to make it easy nice to work on add shit like this because having a nice big place that you can put a you know this is it's intended so that when you have your when you have your scope probe you know you've got your ground clip and you're not this way you're not like trying to go oh I got to get on this edge of that so this is intended so that if you're not stuck trying to probe onto the ends of leads. Like, you know, say you need a ground and you didn't have one of these nice test leads. It's like, oh, hey, look, the end of this diode is a ground. But then you're probing around and, you know, oh, fuck. And then suddenly you're dragging a, you know, a presumably grounded pin all over the circuit board and blowing shit up and, you know, massive failure. Whereas with something big like this, it, you know, it really, it sits over it. Like you have a lot of, actually, I should probably put it on like that. So, you know, I mean, that, you know, I mean, you're probing around, you're tugging on it, and that ain't going anywhere, you know. I mean, it might, well, actually, I guess if you pull hard enough, but I was picking up the whole board. <laughs> so, it really, adding dedicated test points, especially loop-type test points are the best things. You know, and they're also great, like, if you're in a situation where, you know, you have, say, you know, some sort of logic analyzer harness, and it's like, okay, I want to... You know, so I, you, you want to go on here, you have, as long as you have these little loop clip leads, you know, these will stay on here and, you know, you can clip on and you have a really, really positive connection there. You know, so this is not going to come off. You'll probably break the wire or bend something before that comes off. You know, so if you have situations, you can also get, you know, for another example is if you want to measure voltages, you can get basically test probe leads for your digital multimeter that are a banana to a clip lead and then, you, know, you can clip lead on there and then that's a really solid connection that's not going to come loose and you don't have to worry too much about it. You know, and that's an area where loop probes are, you know, because if you try and put one of these on one of these vertical probes, you know, I mean, it'll kind of stay, but it's, I, I'd worry about it. This is more of something, you know, these are really intended for something that plugs down on top of them. And these are actually rather unusual test points. I'm not too sure what kind of equipment these are intended for. You know, I would guess it's intended for, again, something kind of like these leads on here, where you have a, a plug on the end, but they're too large in diameter. They're not like standard pin header diameters. So, it's kind of an unusual connection. But anyways, it's just... I love this sort of test probe, you know, this ground sort of thing here, because you can just... You know, you get such a positive clip onto it. And I always forget, which drives me bananas, so I have... I actually, if you look on one of the, mo the monitors, at my job, I actually have this big sticky note right on the top of the monitor. Add test points, you idiot! Because I'm always seem to be in a hurry, and then it's like, oh god, the board's electrically done. Send it, ship it, ship it, ship it. You know, go get the product, go get the prototype made. You know, because I'm always seem to be in a hurry. So, you know, I mean, I generally don't forget on production stuff, but I always forget on prototypes, and it always drives me nuts because then I'm like soldering leads onto the ends of resist of diodes to try and add test points to a board I should have thought to design a, a proper you know, little loop test point in. You know. Anyways, that's me bitching about me being stupid. So let me put this back together. So you can see these slots here. So that sticks in there. And then that slips over that little yellow tab and then this slides up and pokes through like that and then what I should do is properly install this screw in here so basically what this screw does is it just 
putting it in the right place, or uh, that I'm centered. <laughs> So one thing of interest is that this, this test point is not grounded, it's actually isolated though, not very strongly. So I'm betting that basically this whole board is, well no, it's, it's going to be grounded through that TO3 device, so. Okay, so that's the one differently threaded screw hole in the whole frickin' thing is the one I don't have the frickin' screw for. Rassum, frassum, it looks like a... Like a 632. Well, I finally found a screw that fits this little threaded hole, so... I will finish up the reassembly. I also went out and had dinner, but anyways. <laughs> Tabs up and it sits in there. Actually, kind of amazing. These say rear foot on them. Oh, I see how this works. <laughs> so these have just a little, they're cam lock. So they push on and then slide. I probably should have removed these first. But what I will do is just take all four off and probably put little rubber footies on here. Anyways. So. We are back together, and then let's go back to the scope. So seeing as all the auto-ranging mechanism is, is done with a, like a hard button press, you know, a big clicky switch, I really strongly doubt that the, there's any mechanism for controlling the range over GPIB, which makes me fairly confident that the one direction that's coming from the GPIB into the rest of the system is probably a, like a, a sample trigger. So when that toggles, it immediately, excuse me then, you know, basically samples and does an acquisition on the the input, so that's probably for triggering that. So I can probably just ignore this, though I, what I will probably try doing is, because this is, I would assume, a phototransistor, and I'll be able to tell that by looking at some of these waveforms on the scope, I may just go in here with just a screwdriver and then just kind of shove it against these two pins. And what that should do is that should basically simulate this LED being on, because when this LED is on, it biases the phototransistor on, which pulls it down against this pull-up resistor here, which you, I showed earlier. So I should be able to kind of, just by doing that, fake the GPIB system, HPIB, GPIB system, uh, make, fake the sample trigger, you know, with a, a extremely low-tech mechanism. Anyways, so another nice thing is that when this is on here, there's no exposed line voltage because everything's on the secondary of the transformer. So, power up. Now what I will do is, oops, there goes one of the baggies. I thought I was making a mess. So, somewhere in here I saw, there it is. There only one ground loop. It's mildly annoying. So that will just go on like that. And then I will wait for the scope to finish booting. Closer. You go away. We want to be running. So I would assume that's ground. That means this is probably okay. So that's data, and that's clock. So first of all, you can see our signal is pretty small, and I think that's because it's going into the base of a transistor. So normal. Let's 
So then this should get me. Yeah. So just ignore all the high frequency crap. That's just poor grounding technique on the scope probes. So it's basically irrelevant. So what I am interested in is that. So what, let's see. I want to be on. We'll be triggering on channel three. So nothing is. Tr we're not getting a, a, a acquisition trigger. So let's actually let me. There's no easy way to go to the other side of the. Uh, there's the ground in there. So actually, I think I can just probably... Because these two sides should be isolated. Actually, I wonder... Yes, so I should be able to simply probe on both sides of the isolation barrier and I'll it'll add noise to the system because now I'm bridging the barrier between the two isolated sections but because I'm I'm only doing testing I don't really care so I will clip on to oops, one end of that resistor and the other end of that resistor so actually yeah that's an interesting demo that doesn't add much noise it actually brings the noise down that's kind of interesting so what we have there and then if I go like this, yeah, okay, so you can see that I've clipped onto 5 volts. So let me go trigger source 3. So the, the ground is on 5 volts on the other side, which is nice, because I can do that because it's floating. So if I go like that, so if I force it to act with acquire, So it seems like if I pull this low, when I release it, it begins triggering. Actually, so display, how do I get it into chart recorder mode? So, you can see that we have, let's see, let's turn my intensity up. You can see our, our samples, and then if I, if I pull this low, it stops. So it appears that it's more accurate to say that what we have here is merely uh, a, a sample inhibit. So if I put a... So I put a voltage on there, and then if I do an inhibit, remove the voltage, it holds that value. So, you know, basically right now, oops, let me zoom out a little bit. So right now you can see that there's nothing on the inputs and yet it's holding 5 volts, and if I remove my hold, it'll reacquire. Whereas if I insert if I go like that, you can see now I'm applying 5 volts. Now it ranges. Oh, that's interesting. So there's something else that's cool I just noticed. So look at this. So, I basically, I disable acquisition. I apply a voltage. And I enable acquisition. And you can see, actually, um, let's see, I can't do that, but you can see that we have two samples here where it's producing data but not producing clock, and what I'm fairly, I think is going on here 
is we're seeing the auto ranging. So that's presumably, um, I would, oh, actually. Let's see if I can't see that data. Do I have, yes. Wind scope is wind. So you can see that we have data here, but So there's data there, but it's not displaying it because it, you know, basically the data is not valid. So that's how it manages to not display. It, it basically it gates the clock to disable reading out the value when it's reading out as overrange. So I wonder if there's actually like a separate overrange thing. But anyways, you can also see that it looks like our Let's see. Basically, the, the acquisition to acquisition time is really. Cursor B. Right now we're at 500 milliseconds per div. So it looks like it manages three, it's one acquisition every 350 milliseconds or so. So that would give us a, a basically an a acquisition, well, 400 milliseconds if I turn the cursors right. So it looks like we get roughly one, or, you know, 2.5 samples per second. So you can see. You know, and then actually if I, all right, so that's the maximum. So then you can also see, I disable it and we get one sample afterwards. And then you can see that, oops, stop. So there is it auto ranging. And then, then it begins producing a clock, presumably once it's found the range it wants. Actually, I wonder if I use a much higher voltage Will it have to step through more values? So now let's put 60 volts on it. Remove it. I'm ready to stop it. Two, three, four. Yeah. So you can see that with it, it needed to to uh, switch through three ranges to find. Hang on, let me turn the cursors off. I needed to switch through three ranges to get a valid signal now because I went from 60 volts to 0 volts rather than 5 volts to 0 volts. So presumably that's basically it's down at millivolt. So it's that's going to be, you know, 200 millivolt or it cycles from with well, the 5 volt input it cycles from 20 volts, 2 volts, 200 millivolts and then at 200 millivolts it's valid I would guess. Whereas in the other case it goes to, you know, 200 volts I think. So there's one more step along the way. But that's just a cool little demo. And you can start to see how the various bits work. What the hell is that? Oh, the, the leads from my power supply isn't brushing each other on the bench. Hey. So now I'm just playing around with testing. You can see right now I've just got two clip leads on here. You know, just shorted out together. And you can see that we have the resistance of these leads is approximately 0.1 ohm. Uh, you can see that we get two significant digits when we're down at, you know, basically 20 in the 20 ohm scale. So where is my little box of resistors? I recently just bought some cheapo little boxes of 1% resistors off of Amazon, actually, just because I don't have any parts on hand that aren't specific to a particular project, and I was needing to do some hacking, and it wound up being kind of uncomfortable actually. Uh, so let's see, actually, this will be an interesting little test. Here's some 10 meg resistors. So given that we had 0.1 ohms is 10 meg, so we'll actually to see how rapidly it auto ranges. You can see we have 1.00. It's basically 10 megs, and you can also see this one has a meg scale. What is the resistance between two of these, actually? That's an interesting question. So, it looks like this insulating tape is pretty well effective. So, 
So obviously just wiggling the leads has an effect. So this one's a little high, it's 1.0, or 10.056 or something. This thing doesn't seem to do much in the way of averaging. A lot of that might be lead connection issues. So actually, let me get a 100 ohm resistor and we'll see how, or well, let me get a 10 ohm resistor and we'll see how rapidly it auto-ranges down. That's a zero ohm resistor. Let's see, well, those are one ohms that work. So we're at, we're in the mega ohm scale. So, derp. doesn't fuck around much, does it? Looks like it's cycling through about six ranges. So, yeah, so it looks like these are also pretty on the button. Because you can see that we have, uh, with 0.1 ohm in the leads, this one may be a little tiny bit high. So for something that's 25, this is 30, 33 years old, it's still pretty freaking accurate. A lot of this old stuff just doesn't really ever go bad. I mean, if a chip fails, you're kind of SOL, but it, calibration's remarkably decent, especially if, you know, I don't need a high-precision multimeter at the moment. If I do, I'll buy something new probably, but, you know, three and a half digits is fine. You know, so there, it's just a, not bad for $40. You know, I like this more than I like the uh, the Keithley, just because this has a. It it says O oh L. It doesn't flash, which is kind of insane. I don't know. I think that's bananas. So you can see. Actually, I wonder how the input null is. So let me just, or how the, if it if its idea of zero scale is actually fairly zero. So. close enough, 0.1 millivolts. So, you know, another thing of interest here is that this thing has a microamp range. So it's probably, you know, I didn't actually, when I think about it, I didn't see a fuse, but then, oh, of course the fuse is in series with it. I wonder if there's another fuse in the microamp range. That might have been what that weird little glass encapsulated thing was. It's also got like a 20 ohm range. So 20 ohms, 20 megs, it's not bad. And the auto scaling, whatever this is, this doesn't seem to actually be doing any switching. It seems to be just sending signals to the microprocessor somehow, which is kind of nice. You know, it's not like it's it's switching parts out in the feedback loop. Anyways, there you go. There's another little, a rather nice little digital, well, a decent, fairly accurate bench multimeter that I will. Just live on my bench and hopefully I'll use. I'll probably use this more than the Keithley, but we'll see. It's nice to have lots of meters.